This is the Children's Medical Center Safe Surgery Checklist Teaching Video. Our mission is to improve the safety with which surgical care is delivered at Children's Medical Center. Our strategy in developing this checklist was to examine our current universal protocol and identify problems and potential problems that are not currently addressed. We then modified the current process to address these issues. So you might ask, why a checklist? So first of all, what is a checklist? And what does it contain? Well, a checklist contains things that are very important that we do not want to forget. It also contains things that are not obvious. These are things that are not an integral part of the process and might be forgotten, but things that we want to accomplish every single time. For example, giving a dose of pre-op antibiotics. The last category of things that a checklist contains is things that have been forgotten in the past, and this, this speaks to institutional memory. Who uses checklists? Well, the airline industry, space flight, so on and so forth. What do all these industries have in common? Well, they are all high risk and complex. For us, surgery is our high risk and complex industry. So you might ask, what impact have checklists had in the operating room? You might be familiar with this study from 2009 in the New England Journal. The Safe Surgery Saves Lives study group hypothesized that a 19-item surgical checklist that they created would improve team communication and consistency of care and reduce complications and deaths associated with surgery. The study was conducted over a 12-month period. It was carried out in eight different countries around the globe on adult patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. And this is what they found. The mortality rate went down by almost half after the checklist went in place, and the surgical complication rate went down by about a third. And what this tells us is that the checklist reduced surgical-related morbidity and mortality. This other study came out in 2011. Essentially what this group did was they put operating room teams through several critical operating room scenarios. Half the time the groups went through the scenarios without a checklist and half the time with a checklist. And what they found was critical management steps were, were adhered to 96% of the time with a checklist and only 76% of the time when no checklist was used. And this tells us that checklists remind us to do critical things. So let's do this at Children's. This is the 19-item checklist that the World Health Organization developed. And you might ask, why three parts? Well, let's take a step back and look at the airline industry where pilots do three checklists. Their first checklist makes sure that they're ready to turn on the engines. The second checklist they do makes sure that they're safe to take off. And they actually do a third checklist to make sure that they're safe to land the plane. Similarly, in the operating room, we need to make sure that we're actually ready to go back to the operating room before we even start doing anything else. Then we need to make sure we're safe to actually start the operation or procedure. And lastly, a new concept, that we're safe to end the operation and safe to send the patient to the next point of care. These three-part checklists have been widely adopted at different children's hospitals in our country and indeed around the world. So this is the checklist that we've developed for children's. And the yellow part tells us that we're ready to go back to the operating room, the green part that we're safe to start the operation, and the purple part that we're safe to end the operation and safe to send the patient to the next point of care. The idea is that the checklist is sort of like a grocery store. The concept is that you start at one end of the grocery store and work your way to the other end, going past every aisle and deciding if there's anything down that aisle that you want. Similarly with the checklist, you start at the top of the checklist and work your way all the way down, looking at each element and deciding whether it pertains to your operation or not. The idea is that in moving from the top to the bottom of the checklist, you address every single item, but it's fast and you get out of it what you need for your case. The yellow section is performed so that we know that we're ready to go back to the operating room. This is performed by the pre-op nurse and circulator. And interestingly, we already do these. However, putting it all together in one place in EPIC provides a formal way to consolidate the process that we already do and decreases the chance that we miss something. The new elements in this checklist are DVT prophylaxis and warming. The DVT prophylaxis element tells the nurses to assess the child and place TEDs or SCDs on the patient if that's needed. 
the warming measures element allows the nurses to decide if warming is required during the case and to set this up in the operating room before the patient gets there if this is necessary. Completing this tells us that we're ready to go back to the operating room. The green section is performed by the entire surgical team and tells us that we're safe to start the operation. Again, we already do some of these elements. However, there are several new elements, including team introductions where everybody introduces themselves by their name and their role. We then talk about pharmaceuticals. This includes antibiotics and any other medications that might be needed from the pharmacy for the case. We next address risk of blood loss and if blood is needed for the case to ensure that it is in the room if that's what is wanted. Positioning, padding, and straps is next. And this would be the time to address any changes in position that are necessary in the middle of the case and any equipment needed for positioning. We next talk about radiology and we want to make sure that the relevant images have been reviewed and are available. Under equipment implants and special requests, this is the time for anyone in the room to say what they need for the operation, particularly if you notice that it is not in the room. A fire risk assessment then needs to be done and essentially any source of heat or fuel needs to be addressed and this includes alcohol-based preparation, oxygen, um, or any heat source. This is a new element in the timeout where cases that are booked for longer than 60 minutes need to have the expected duration discussed along with an antibiotic redosing plan, a warming plan, and whether DVT prophylaxis is necessary. Completing the green section tells us that we're safe to start the operation. At the end of the operation, the debrief is done, and this is led by the surgeon. Completing this section tells us that we're safe to finish the operation and send the patient to the next point of care. Starting at the top, this is a statement of the procedure performed along with any implants that were placed. Next is specimens. What is the name of the specimen and where is it going and the test that it, it is going for. Next, the counts are addressed by the circulator and the scrub tech. Under opportunities for improvement, any team member can bring up any issues that were encountered during the case. More importantly, the appropriate person on the team should propose a solution and take ownership of the problem with a plan to solve it so it does not happen again. In patient recovery and management, this is the time where post-op expectations are discussed and the child can leave the operating room with the whole team on the same page. Suggested elements to discuss here include medications, specifically antibiotic and pain medications, what to do with the tubes and lines that currently are in the patient, whether they're coming out at the end of the case or if the child is going out of the operating room with the same tubes and lines, any other key concerns, and their destination, whether they're going to the floor, the ICU, or home after the PACU. Next, we document who is going to write the operative note and the post-op orders, and this is so that expectations are clear and providers distal to the operating room know who to call if they have questions. The box on the bottom pertains to patients going directly to the ICU from the operating room. This addresses a warming measure to keep the patient warm between the operating room and the ICU, any post-op studies that are needed when the patient gets to the ICU, and who is going to give ICU report on the physician and the nursing level. Finishing this purple debrief section tells us that we're safe to end the operation and safe to send the patient to the next point of care. On a personal note, I've had several checklist saves, including preventing a potential acetaminophen overdose at the end of a case. In addition to that, we've also straightened up documentation by stating the procedure performed at the end of the case because this was different than what was booked. And this allowed the nurse the opportunity to change the documentation in EPIC to match the operative note. In addition, under opportunities for improvement, equipment that has not been on the card previously and that we had to wait for during the case was added on by the scrub tech and submitted so that in future cases the equipment is available at the beginning of the case. The checklist can help improve several things, including appropriate antibiotic administration, preventing hypothermia, the availability of operating room equipment, and most importantly, communication and safety culture. We also hope that the checklist will reduce specimen problems, inaccuracies in documentation, and nursing confusion about who to call with questions after the surgery. 
Things that we're looking at to document checklist success here at Children's include a decrease in surgery-related RCAs, um, and some of the other things we mentioned in the previous slide, including appropriate antibiotic administration, a decrease in hypothermia, and improvement in safety culture. And it would be fabulous if we can do all of this without a significant increase in operating room time. In fact, we did measure whether the checklist increased operating room time during our pilot at Legacy. We looked at in-room time to out-of-the-room time for patients undergoing tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy and appendectomy. We chose these because of their high volume and because of the predictability with which these cases are carried out. We looked at four months before the checklist and four months after the checklist went in place. And this is what we found. For tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, in fact, there was a five-minute reduction in OR time, and this was statistically significant. For appendectomies, the post-checklist time was a little bit shorter, although this didn't reach statistical significance. But what this tells us is that once we are facile at performing the checklist, it really doesn't add operating room time to add the safety check to what we do. We started the pilot at Legacy at the end of February, and after several debriefs and modifications, we've built a final version into EPIC, which went live in August. The Learning Institute is helping us develop our education, and we are educating providers at the Dallas Pavilion and South Lake operating rooms through the month of October. The checklist will go live at the Dallas Pavilion and South Lake operating rooms on November 5th. The checklist development team would like to thank you as well as our supporters at Children's for helping to make this successful. If you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback, please contact Lee Ern Chen.